So it's, it's really a, a strong focus of this office to reach out, particularly for the benefit of developing countries, emerging space nations, to reach out, organize conferences, workshops, holding technical advisory missions. Welcome. AstroTalk UK is a not-for-profit podcast on astronomy, science and spaceflight. Launched in 2008, it's produced by me, Guru Beer Singh, a writer based in the UK. I produce this podcast for my own education, but frankly, it allows me to meet fascinating people doing interesting things. It's primarily for my own education, and I share it as a free educational resource. No ads, no subscriptions, and you don't need to log in. For more, see the About page on AstroTalk UK. Org. Episode 101 Peaceful Uses of Outer Space Nicholas Hedman, the Acting Director of the United Nations Office for the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, UN USA, talks about UN USA's ongoing role in facilitating and promoting peaceful uses of space in low Earth orbit and beyond. In this interview, recorded in July during COSPAR 2022 in Athens, he speaks about the challenges and opportunities of space in the context of increasing commercial activities, mega satellite constellations, small satellites, legally and non-legally binding instruments, and planetary protection. He highlights few of many resources available online from UN USA's website, including the Space Objects Register, Online Index, and Sustainable Development Goals. He starts off by outlining the role of his office. This office is a fairly small office in the UN system, so we are 30 start, staff members in total. Three zero. Yep, three zero. Uh, so you can imagine it's, it's quite small. And what we do, as I said, we, we service, uh, we provide, you know, the, the secretariat services to the intergovernmental body, meaning preparing for everything, doing reports, uh, managing the, the adoption of the report from sessions, etc. So there we really have a lot of tasks. What we also do is, and this is important to note, we, we have a mandate which says we are discharging the responsibility of the UN Secretary General under the legal regime of outer space. Which means that if you look at the treaties and if you look at principles and those instruments, there are certain requirements vested with the Secretary General mm -hmm. that the Secretary General should disseminate information, the Secretary General should uphold the registration, for instance, that is one of those requirements, mm -hmm. but also dissemination of information from states' parties. And that is vested with this, this office. So we acting on behalf of the Secretary General in that regard. Mm -hmm. What we also do uh, in the office, we also also provide on a regular basis every year a lot of capacity building activities in the use of space science and technology applications. So it's, it's really a, a strong focus of this office to reach out, particularly for the benefit of developing countries, emerging space nations, to reach out, organize conferences, workshops, holding technical advisory missions in areas and many many areas mm -hmm. that where you're using space technology so that is what we're doing also and recently uh, actually in 2019 we also started a project where we are conducting technical advisory missions and organizing uh, regional workshops or national workshops or international workshops on space law and policy. So we also now have entered into the area of space law where we are servicing states upon their request when they want to enact 
regulatory frameworks at their national level or they want to to adopt a space policy mm -hmm. and, and there are questions you know surrounding this yeah. so then we help them in that regard bearing in mind that you have to deal with not only the new entrants in space there are so many countries now commercial space mm -hmm. actors which are uh, also growing and space law and space policy which is um, driving um, the commercial sector how do you manage that on just 30 people well uh, we we as I said yes we we as a very small office and we have a, a huge tasks mm. that we are conducting but we are working collaboratively with states with our member states uh, with organizations and so it's not that we are doing everything alone you see <laughs> so when we organize workshops and conferences uh -huh. uh, we always do that uh, together with partners so we we get you know help and we co-organize mm. activities mm. but indeed it's uh, it's quite a big task and it's a growing sector mm. uh, space activities are growing and and you can you can see that over time if you compare to space activities in 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 the early age mm. uh, in the late 50s mm. early 60s you can't you can't really compare it to where we are today mm. technological advancement in the in the uh, in the um, the space field but mm. also the growing diverse sector of mm. space activities where you have now private commercial entities also entering into this huge business of, mm. of space and uh, and that is of course um, something that that is engaging because we, we see how impactful space is in society also mm. today um, we the the growing importance of using space technology applications for as I said earlier for uh, achieving the sustainable development goals mm -hmm. um, you know achieving sustainable development uh, achieving a societal development of mm -hmm. countries etc there is space is there to stay and to grow as a tool back to the registration convention you mentioned yeah. um, it's been around for a long time are all states who've signed up uh, to participate in it, participating in it, and um, is this register available publicly? Yep. So uh, the registration convention from 1975. Um, if I'm correctly um, understood now, I think it has around uh, 80 or 70 or 80 states parties, so it's not as many as the Outer Space Treaty. Um, the register is publicly available on the website of my office, the Office for Outer Space Affairs. Mm -hmm. So anyone can go in there and check. And so the register is, is really a, a, a collection of formal notifications, the registration submission, and uh, we have then uh, translated into all the official languages of the United Nations. All those documents are there. But we also have made available on our website an online index, which is a research tool. So you can, you can check if you know the name of a spacecraft or you're interested to see your country, if your country, uh, what they have registered and also what they have launched in terms of spacecraft mm -hmm. you go in there and you find that information and you can see um, precisely what's the status of those space objects. I remember looking a few years ago mm. and one of the things I noticed was that not all states were providing all the details for every launch that uh, yep. were engaged in. Um, uh, is that particularly, uh, as my, my experience was with the military spacecraft yep. that they were very um, ambiguous about mm. <laughs> and just kept very fields blank. Um, is that uh, an issue? Is it still going on? Is that likely to improve in the future? Well, I, I would say, um, I, I, I would turn it um, the other way around and say that uh, it's interesting to note that the major spacefaring nations do register also reconnaissance and military satellites. They do that um, because the registration convention does not distinguish between a satellite used for civilian purposes or military purposes. It talks about space objects, so it's equal, you see. And they do that well. Then, of course, the information provided is, of course, a selection they have to make. And when it comes to 
military activities or reconnaissance intelligence, intelligence activities, then they often choose not to provide full information, obviously. So, and, and, and although at that time I thought this is really um, not fair or reasonable, but in practice, looking back, given the history, mm. it, it's been really a remarkable success, I think. Would you agree? Um, yes, uh, I would say when we look at, I would say the following, on registration, uh, interesting to note that actually majority of satellites that are being sent into orbit around the Earth or beyond, they are being registered. So we have quite a good registration rate. Mm -hmm. uh, what we now see um, in, in the past very few years, and it will increase, is the deployment of mega constellations. So you have those large constellations comprising perhaps in the future thousands of satellites. And of course uh, that is the challenge is then how to register all this and get it into the system. And I would say that they are being registered, those satellites, but the volume is so high that there is a backlog and, and we are trying to catch up because the mega constellations are, are, have begun to be deployed. Just going back to one of the other things you mentioned, um, space debris, I remember the um, uh, interagency debris mitigation guidelines yep. came out quite a few years ago, but they were just guidelines. Yep. And, um, is there any uh, need, any scope for something stronger than guidelines now that there is just so much traffic up there mm. in low Earth orbit? So, correctly, you're right. The IADC guidelines came out in, uh, I would say, in the beginning of, of 2000, so right. perhaps some, some time there. Mm. And I, I recall that at COPUS, mm. uh, the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, there was a working group working on uh, space debris mitigation at that time. And the IADC guidelines became the basis for the development of United Nations uh, space debris mitigation mitigation guidelines. So we have guidelines on space debris mitigation from 2007 right. and they are based on the IADC guidelines. So right. there is a connection there. Right. Uh -huh. And they are voluntary and non-legally binding. Obviously uh, it's, um, it's non-legally binding but uh, it is the interest of, of spacefaring nations to take it seriously. So they do implement uh, and apply space debris mitigation measures in the conduct of space activities. They do that. Well, most do. I mean, uh, yeah, the major spacefaring nations. Yeah. Yes. What is what is important now yeah. is to get all new emerging space nations that yeah. are starting to deploy. Mm -hmm objects in orbit to also do that. Yeah. So that is what we are working with. Um, in 2019 uh, we uh, adopted an instrument, also non-legally binding, yeah. so it's a voluntary instrument, but an instrument that took 10 years to develop right. and it's called the long-term sustainability guidelines. So, so the guidelines for the long-term sustainability of outer space activities mm -hmm. and those guidelines are interesting because they apply to, it's a policy instrument applying you know the treaties mm -hmm. in how you you should conduct space activities and regulate space activities at your national level mm -hmm. Precisely for mm -hmm. the uh, safety of space operations. So it's all about avoiding collision, mm -hmm. avoiding uncontrolled re entry of space objects into mm -hmm. the atmosphere, etc. They're just examples. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and those guidelines, are this is very important now, they have been quite recently adopted in 2019. Mm -hmm. So now, what this intergovernmental body is looking at now is to promote implementation of those guidelines. So states still need to put those guidelines into practice. Mm. And that is what now is, is at focus. And, and um, you know, I, I commend that and it's been working really well. But I remember I was in, um, I happened to be in Switzerland in 2019, yep. in March when India tested this anti-satellite weapon. Mm. And there was a lot of cases in 2007 for China, the US yep. and USSR, all many mm. of these big space players have done that. And that's a, a real headache 
for sp space debris issues. And uh, it's always been mitigation guidelines. Do you think there's any appetite? Because everybody, I'm sure, would agree, all the um, space actors would agree, that it's in their interest <laughs> to have these in place. They seem to remain uh, guidelines rather than something more stronger. Do you think that might change in the coming years? I would say, currently, there is no consensus among the major spacefaring nations and all those hundred states of COPUS to uh, adopt legally binding instruments in space activity. So, to answer your questions, I don't see that there would be in the foreseeable future any new treaty or any new legally binding instruments on space debris or yeah. those, those matters for that sake. So we have to then deal with what we can achieve and that is to convince states to implement you know their obligations under the treaties and then via those guidelines that are supporting instruments so the space debris mitigation guidelines and those long-term sustainability guidelines i mentioned are supporting instruments to make it easier for states to implement that uh, on on the um, on those intentional destruction of uh, space objects that you mentioned just want to make the note that I'm not commenting on that because we are dealing with the civilian peaceful yeah. uses of outer space so mm -hmm. those I would say military activities are concerned with elsewhere in the UN system mm -hmm. but obviously in our sessions mm -hmm. of these intergovernmental bodies there are always comments to that effect because from the perspective of space debris creation yeah. you see mm. yeah yeah i mean it's just so disheartening um, but anyway to, to move on to um you already mentioned um mega constellations mm. do they bring in additional concerns about uh, a, a challenge to the safe and sustainability guidelines that uh, we should be operating in oh yes it, it is a concern but it, it's also uh, the sector is already aware of of uh -huh. the challenges and the the concerns mm. surrounding mega constellation mm. It's the volume you know it's the nature of having thousands of satellite being being in constellations meaning that you add really a huge volume of new satellites and uh, of course uh, the more you place in orbit the the larger the risk is for collision or mm. or or um, situations you know that can happen so there is the concern but uh, space agencies, governments, they are aware of this. Mm -hmm. the, the companies that are manufacturing and deploying those mega constellations, mm -hmm. they are of course aware of this too. Mm -hmm. The question is, of course, it always, in all activities, is if you are a serious actor and you want to have a long-standing revenue from your activities, you have to also be responsible in how you conduct activities. So it's nothing unique for yeah. outer space activities. And, and that's quite a, yeah. an important point you make because it's in these are commercial operations yeah. and it's in their commercial interest yeah. to pursue these yeah. guidelines. Yeah. Um, We've talked about mega constellations, but small sats, mm -hmm. and they're getting even smaller. Yeah. Uh, is that an additional concern? Uh, I would say it's it's both a concern, but it's also a an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So we have to, legally speaking, when it comes to registration, liability, and all those legal aspects, mm -hmm. uh, there are concerns with small satellites. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, uh, of course, um, when you really go down to, to very small sizes of satellites, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, how do you control, how do you operate those satellites? Because mm -hmm. they are still uh, tangible pieces, it's still physical objects in orbit, mm -hmm. you see. And if you cannot control them, then they, they can cause harm. Mm -hmm. So you all have all those aspects. But what is important to note with the development of small sat and CubeSat mm -hmm. technology is that suddenly you get new countries, particularly small developing countries, mm -hmm. that can enter into the space arena mm -hmm. by having, for instance, a university, uh, manufacturing, building up, doing the research, mm -hmm. constructing a small set for scientific research or for communication, and they can have that satellite being deployed in orbit, and that means that 
that state then suddenly becomes a spacefaring nation. Mm -hmm. And this is growing and this is now leading to more and more small states with no not always robust space mm. infrastructure that mm. they can become part mm. of this new era of space activities. And from that perspective, I must say that it's positive that okay. satellites also get smaller and cheaper, if mm. I put it that way. But they're sometimes they are so small that you, they're not, it's not possible to track them. Um, yeah, they yeah. usually don't have the capacity to um, monitor, um, maintain their orientation. Yeah, yeah. yeah so there are always, you know, there are always uh, um, positive and negative it's sides yeah. on, 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 on everything we do. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, you, you're correct. But I must emphasize the positive nature of bringing more countries into the space mm. uh, environment, if I put it that way. And on that front, um, connecting the two, new space actors, and planetary protection you were speaking of earlier. Yeah. It's, you know, right now we have um, uh, an orbiter around Mars from the United Arab Emirates, from India and, on, and China mm. quite recently and there's a rover from China as well. In terms of um, either backward contamination or which contamination could potentially result from sample return or mm. forward contamination. The microbes from Earth going elsewhere. Mm. Are the new space act actors, usually um, in terms of budget and experience in mm. space uh, operations and building spacecraft, um, and you know, very soon they will be visiting planets and mm. comets, asteroids, and returning mm. samples. Mm. Um, are the new space actors, um, uh, are they able, capable, and to, from your experience, um, engaging in the planetary protection mm -hmm. protocols? Yes, they are. And um, I, I, it's a good question and I, I will also inform you that this COSPAR panel on planetary protection mm -hmm. um, comprises of representatives of space agencies. So right. there we have representatives from NASA, from ISRO, the Indian Space mm -hmm. uh, Agency, from the Chinese Space Agency, right. UAE, etc. You know, the and Roscosmos and mm -hmm. a European Space Agency and also uh, national European agencies. So we have representatives from space agencies there, mm -hmm. plus scientific expertise. So we mm -hmm. have expertise in the areas concerning with planetary protection. Mm -hmm. So astrobiology, microbiology, etc. Mm -hmm. And I would say that uh, it's, it's in the interest of uh, actors when they perform missions mm -hmm. to the moon and other celestial bodies, it is in their own interest mm -hmm. to, uh, to really uphold the system that we have created via the policy on planetary protection mm. and to take this seriously. So, so it's in all our interest, but it's important then now when we will see more and more missions being planned and then being executed mm -hmm. that uh, we, we, we really do this carefully and that we always keep in mind the, the need to balance the interests mm -hmm. between policy interest of governments, commercial interests of private sector and the scientific interest of the scientific community. Mm. So it's always needed, you know, to balance those interests. And uh, what is important to note when it comes to the planetary protection activities, and as I said, we have a policy that we are maintaining, mm. is that it's not an environmental instrument, so it's not that we are protecting planets, the environments of planets. Right. That is not dealt with in this framework. Mm -hmm. It is the protection of future scientific investigation right. on those planets. So we don't want to contaminate mm -hmm. the area where we will perform research yeah. and search for life forms that could be contaminated and therefore destroyed from the perspective of scientific investigation, you see. So I wanted to make that clear. That's very important. Yeah. And, and it's, if, if uh, some microbes are discovered on Mars yeah. in 20 years time, there should be Martian microbes and not uh, Earth microbes yeah. that travelled there 10 years yeah. earlier. Yeah. Uh, very important. And I'm really impressed with, uh, uh, with what 
the activities take place here in Kospar because yeah. they've done so much of the groundwork. Oh yes, and absolutely. So they're, they're very and, supportive. And speaking of Kospar, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, but uh, Kospar was the first permanent observer organization uh, admitted to this intergovernmental body, Coop, mm -hmm. as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. So already in 1962, oh, Kospar right. became an observer to that uh, that intergovernmental body, and Kospar has been quite influential over mm. over those past 60 years mm. in providing scientific reports mm. on experiments in outer space on the protection or I would say not protection but rather environmental impacts mm -hmm. of space activities mm -hmm. and uh, as you know COSPAR is also very much concerned with research on space weather so it has quite a, yeah. a, a robust uh, scientific uh, work on space weather and there COSPAR has also provided valuable scientific information yeah. to the deliberations at the intergovernmental body. So COSPAR is very vital for the work at the policy level, if I put it that way. Uh, and, and I've been impressed with the mm. level of uh, support and information yeah. that's available from countries that have done the research yeah. and new players don't have to repeat it. It's right. so supportive yeah. from what my experience has been. Um, just one last question on planetary protection. You mentioned the panels here uh, contain uh, representation from various uh, space agencies. Mm. Are commercial entities represented there as well? Not as members in the panel because the panel is really limited or I would say it's enough and it's, it's uh, space agencies and the scientific uh, community mm -hmm. because in the end it is uh, governments that are responsible to implement their obligations under space law uh -huh. and space agencies are governmental entities yeah. so it's for the government mm -hmm. to implement and therefore they are responsible for activities of private sector mm -hmm. but what we need to do and we are doing already uh, we are reaching out to private companies mm -hmm. and they are welcome and always invited to attend our open session so when we have discussions with the broader scientific community we also involve mm -hmm. private sector to come and uh, inform what they are doing and we also inform them of the protocols set in place so there is an important dialogue with the uh, the private uh, sector community you know, on space activities particularly uh, developing technologies to go to uh, the moon and other other objects it's remarkable the way you explain things and your depth of experience is, is excellent in communicating this very important and vital aspect of what will shape uh, our collective human f uh, future in the coming decades yeah um, just it, finally, what, um, what are you going to be working on in the coming weeks and, and years and what do you think are the key uh, decisions that we need to make in this area? Well, what, what we have, what is interesting to note in all this is that uh, COOPUS, again, uh, this intergovernmental body, has now this year established two working groups mm -hmm. uh, one working group on these guidelines on long-term sustainability so it will start looking into this area from implementation what states need to implement but also look into do we need further refinement of the guidelines do we need new guidelines so that is one aspect mm -hmm. then we also have a working group in our legal subcommittee and it's the legal subcommittee of COPUS that has developed the international space law right. and that is interesting to note right. and there we now have a new working group under a five-year work plan which will look into legal aspects of space resource activities right. so our 100 states members will discuss the future prospects of exploitation of natural resources from celestial bodies. So this is what we are now going to focus attention on in the coming, coming years. And that is a very important uh, subject to discuss at the global level, I would say, because it's also really about global governance of outer space activities. That's fascinating. And uh, what's your role going to be in that? Are you still staying with the 
you and uh, USA? I'm, I'm leaving you and USA later this year. Oh. Uh, yes, I, I will leave the United Nations. I will retire. Um, but I will be connected probably with COSPAR, where I hope uh, to, um, to continue working, not with planetary protection, right. but with an entirely new uh, structure dealing with um, social science and humanities. Uh, so I, I believe in cross sectorial cross-cutting dialogue between disciplines but also in a scientific organization like COSPAR uh, it's also important to uh, to have a, a discussion and a dialogue on uh, political science, law, other social science areas, and humanities, yeah. ethics, philosophy, you name it. All those aspects that are outside of the traditional scientific disciplines. And you have such a wealth of information to inform that discussion. Nicholas Hetman, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, my pleasure, really.